Hello and welcome back to the Engadget stage live from CES. I'm Joseph Volpe, Engadget's Features Editor, and I'm here with someone you may have read about in the news as the boy wonder of virtual reality, Palmer Lucky. His company, which he began back in 2009 when he was just tinkering with the technology, went on to become acquired by Facebook for $2 billion early last year. He's here on the stage today because the company broke some very significant announcements here at CES, and we're going to pick his brain a little bit and find out what's going on with Oculus VR in 2016. Palmer, welcome to CES. Welcome to the Engadget stage. How are Glad you? Glad to be here again. I love this stage. <laughs> it's super dope. It's nice. The circular, the purple lights. I noticed you're wearing flip-flops and no socks. Th that is the only way to wear <laughs> flip-flops. Are you not cold at all? Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty warm in here. I mean, I'm feeling the sweat and the stink of CES. All right, I'm just, I'm curious. It's been raining and chilly all week. Oh, it's so, chilly outside, but here it's hot, hot, yeah, hot. Yeah, no, I know. It's a lot of human smell, CES too. CES is Vegas' hottest <laughs> new club. <laughs> so this is a really significant CES for Oculus VR, right? Yeah, it is. So we just launched pre-orders for the Rift, our PC virtual reality headset, uh, yesterday morning at 8 a.m., and... We're pretty happy with how that's gone. Yeah. Have they sold out? Um, it depends on the way you look at it. Uh, some, some companies, when they run out of units, will just cease to take orders completely. We're providing some pre-order bonuses for people ahead of time, so we don't really want to close that off to people who still want to get those. Um, we've been building stock up for a long time. We showed a picture back in September of the first rip to come off the assembly line, and we've been working on manufacturing ever since. Uh, but we sold. We sold all of the units we've made so far and will make until our March 28th release date really, really fast. It's, it, they've been selling, I can't talk about it for financial disclosure reasons and stuff, but like, I'm, I'm super stoked. Yeah, it's awesome. I, just before in the green room, I went to go check because I was a little bit too late uh, pre-ordering and I see they're saying June 1st now I for think shipping. We, I think we just slipped into the 1st of June, yeah. yeah. We, were, we were in May, May as of late yesterday. Yeah, and before that, it was early April, so... Right. Hopefully, it shouldn't slip too much more because <laughs> we're, we're making a lot of units. It's, yeah. yeah. So fair to say it's done pretty well, right? Yeah, I'm, we're doing... In the early days. So yeah. far, the pre-orders are going very well. Awesome. So when I get the box, when a consumer gets their pre-order of the Rift, what's inside? Break it down for me. So the main thing that you're going to get is the Rift headset itself, which has multiple OLED displays, a high-end tracking system. It's built really nice with a lot of cutting-edge materials and optics. Um, you also get an Xbox One gamepad, which the majority of virtual reality content over the last few years has been developed around. There's also an Oculus remote. It's essentially a really small, tiny, lightweight remote with just a few buttons on it that allows you to do things like play, pause, move from scene to scene uh, without having to hold an entire gamepad. It has about 4,000 hours of battery life, so uh, it's, 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 <laughs> that's pretty it, good, yeah. It's, just, it's like a small pendant remote. It costs us a few bucks to add, and for a lot of people, it's going to be a useful addition. It also comes with an Oculus tracking sensor, which is what's able to track the movement of the headset 360 degrees through space and accurately reflect that in what you see. Now, what about the games? Obviously, there's been a lot of lead time. We've been talking about VR. We've been demoing it. The game developers have had their hands on it. When somebody gets their unit March 28th, early April, what are they going to get? How many games are going to be available to play? So the first things that they're going to get are going to be Lucky's Tale, which is a 3D platformer that's bundled with every Rift, and Eve Valkyrie, which is a uh, title by uh, CCP that is being bundled with every pre-order. It's a space dog fighting game. Um, there's a bunch of other titles that are going to be coming. Oculus Studios, our internal kind of studios and publishing branch, has about 20 games coming out next year, and we have a lot more games coming from third parties. Uh, there's also a bunch of tech demos and things. Like on our current website, Oculus Share, we have about 1,000 of these tech demos and experiences that developers have created over the last three years. A lot of those are going to be on the Rift, but we don't want to be out there saying, you know, oh, there's going to be hundreds of games, because a lot of the things that are being made are short experiences and demonstrations. There's, but there are going to be dozens of full games next year. And you did say that Oculus Story Studio content would then would also be on the Rift when people get their pre-orders? That is correct. Oculus yes. Story Studio is our internal film studio that's working mostly on short films in virtual reality, figuring out how to do storytelling and then sharing that with people in the film industry so that they can learn from our mistakes, our many mistakes, and copy some of the good <laughs> things we've found. 
uh, because we really want to help jumpstart this industry. And we're starting to see a lot of adoption from Hollywood and other people, partially because of Story Studio and how successful they've been with narrative storytelling and virtual reality. Now, with Story Studio, you guys have announced uh, five shorts, correct? Only two have been shown so far. Will we see a third before you're going to be seeing, the Rift? You're going to see an, you're going to see at least one more before the Rift launches. We're actually showing it at Sundance Film Festival at the end of the month. Excellent. And that one is... No spoilers, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'll, that, that, that's up to the Story Studio team. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, you guys did something significant with Kickstarter because that's essentially where you got all of your funding uh, in the beginning to start Oculus. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? So in the start, we started raising money on Kickstarter to develop our first Rift development kits, DK1. We raised about $2.4 million from people on Kickstarter, and that was really what showed that there was confidence in our company. Now, granted, in the end, we actually ended up losing money on the Kickstarter. Uh, but that aside, that is the reason we were able to attract institutional investment. We were able to attract uh, almost $100 million in investment before our acquisition by Facebook. Uh, and so we decided that we wanted to do something for all of those people who really helped us get to where we are. All of the people who not only supported us back when we were a Kickstarter that by all means really shouldn't have been able to deliver what we did. I mean, there's a lot of Kickstarters that have issues delivering, uh, and we came close a few times. Uh, but we decided to give back to all those people, especially because many of them have gone on to make games for the Rift, by giving all of them a free consumer Rift uh, is out of the first batch right when we ship. That's awesome. Now, is there anything on it that's special for them to denote that this is an early Kickstarter backer? Is it a different color? So it is, it is a special Kickstarter edition. We haven't shown it off just yet, okay. uh, but, but there are some differences. Okay. Can you talk about them at all, or is it a surprise? No, I'm sorry. I can't. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I want to go back to something, which is the $5.99 price point for just the Rift, right? You have the Rift, and then you also have the Oculus Ready PC program. Right. So if you don't have a PC that can run it, you can get one starting at 1500 I believe. Right. 14, the bundles are going to be starting at 1499 for a PC that runs the Rift and the Rift together. Okay. So there's been a lot of back and forth about the pricing for the initial Rift. Um, I personally think it's fair and reasonable given what you're getting, uh, but I've also been reporting on this for a while, so I understand what's involved. Um, but some other people feel it's uh, too much of a barrier to entry. So what's your response to that? I guess the response would be, first of all, that we did not do a good job of managing expectations of what people thought VR was going to cost for the headset itself, especially people, for people who were looking at our previous products and us talking about how we wanted to make VR accessible to people and saying, well, DK2, which did use mostly off-the-shelf parts, we go, that was only $350. That's what it's going to cost. Um, what you're getting for $599, which is the price for, for the bundle with the games and the controllers and everything, I... It is, I'm not going to say it's a low-cost consumer electronics product, but when you look at other products that are $5.99, like tablets, PCs, um, or phones, or televisions, you're getting a lot more for $5.99 than you're getting anywhere else. We've talked a lot about how we're not making money on the hardware. Our goal is to make money by selling virtual reality software. And when you spend $5.99 on a phone, it costs a fraction of that to manufacture. When you buy a $5.99 TV, it costs a fraction of that to manufacture. When you buy a Rift, you are getting an insane deal in terms of the components that go into it. As far as consumer adoption goes, it is true that that is a barrier to adoption, but it's not the biggest barrier. By far the biggest barrier is going to be the PC. You need a high-end computer to run the Rift and really to run any virtual reality headset at a quality that everyone will be comfortable with. We could have sold a, a lesser product. We could have sold a product that was, let's say, $400 or $500 by significantly reducing the quality of the headset. But when you look at that all-in investment of the PC and the headset together, that's only reducing the all-in cost from $1,500 to $1,400 or maybe $1,300. The sad truth is that even at $1,300, PC VR, high-end PC virtual reality, is not going to make the jump from PC gaming to the mass market enthusiast audience. That's going to happen when the cost of the headset comes down, when the cost of PCs come down, ideally when people can use the PC they already own to play the Rift. Because then you don't need to buy your PC, upgrade a PC to do anything. You just have to buy this device, plug it into what you've already had. And we're also working on the low end of the market through our partner Samsung with Gear VR, which is you know, already doing a really good job of going mainstream and being used by people who aren't gamers. In fact, most of the time people are spending on Gear VR isn't even on games. It's on things like videos and social applications. Uh, which is somewhat surprising, but it shows there are people who want to use VR for things other than high-end gaming. Uh, 
but they're probably not going to be adopting a first generation Rift as long as it's going to cost them $1,500 all in to start using that. So, you know, given that it's $599 and it's first to market, where do you think the Rift is going to slot in when you have something like the Sony PlayStation VR and the HTC Vive coming out? Um, obviously, you know, Vive is you know, the more high end, right, VR experience, if you want to call it that. Uh, so where do you, you see them starting You could call in? it that. You could call it that. It, it's been called that, right? So where do you see Oculus slotting in there? Personally, I think we have the best VR headset, and I think we have the best VR content library, and the best overall experience, and the best long-term support. Uh, I think that Sony isn't really necessarily competing with us because they're really targeting PlayStation 4 users. They're going to a group of people that... Like I said before, they're not going to go out and buy a $1,500 PC and Rift bundle anyway. And th there might be some people who own a high-end PC and they own a PS4, and they're going to be deciding which headset they buy. But that group is not nearly as large as the millions of people who have a PlayStation 4 that are going to get into VR that just wouldn't have got into it otherwise. Right. So I think for us, that ends up being a positive. It gets more people into the virtual reality industry. It means that there's going to be more content made by more developers. And it means that there's going to be more people fighting this war for virtual reality. The real battle right now is not between the manufacturers. It is VR manufacturers versus public perception of VR. We have to convince people that it's worth it, there's things to do, and that VR actually works, and that it's worth wearing something on your head to use it. Sony's going to be doing a lot of help with us, and uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of other people getting into this game as virtual reality gets even more popular. Do you have any uh, public demonstrations planned similar to the HTC Vive World Tour coming up to sort of educate the public about the Oculus Rift? I mean, we go to a lot of shows. We go to E3, we go to PAX, we go to Anime Expo, we go to Comic-Con. We're at a lot of shows, both in our own booths and in the booths of content partners. So we've, I mean, we've been showing off, that, that's really how we built Buzz from the beginning, because you have to show people virtual reality for them to understand it. There's just no way to get it otherwise. And so, I mean, I've, I think I may have been to like 100 shows at this point. <laughs> it, it feels like in any yeah. way. Um, so we've, we've kind of been on a world tour the whole time, but we're going to continue doing that. We're going to continue ramping it up. And we also announced that we're going to have some retail partnerships where we're going to be able to demo the Rift in retail stores so that people can go to a store and try it out and see what it's all about for themselves. So no Oculus-sponsored VR arcade in the near future? I love the idea, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but right now I'm focused on trying to bring VR in large quantities to people in their homes as opposed to trying to make a super high-end arcade. There are people who are working on that, making VR arcades, but I want to make virtual reality mainstream, and I think that the Rift is one of the first steps in doing that. I think Gear VR is one of the first steps on doing it. That's where you can kind of have these heady daydreams of how you're going to change the world as opposed to having the coolest arcade ever, which is also super cool, just not <laughs> what I'm working on. Right. So I know it was uh, before the holiday season time, around the holidays, you went on a bit of a tweet storm. Right, trying to manage expectations for the Rift. Um, so now that it's coming out, you know, looking forward throughout 2016, how do you see the market taking shape for VR realistically? And what's your hope for it? So I think that this is going to be the first year that consumer VR is very successful. And what people sometimes don't realize is that not every technology has to become mass mainstream all at once. I mean, if you look at the sales of many devices in the early days, even like iPod, Palm Pilot, even the iPhone, the sales they got at launch were minuscule compared to the sales that they got later, after they proved out the market, after the cost came down, after more people could adopt it. VR is in that stage right now. Gear VR is a start. Tons of people are buying Gear VR. I think a lot of people are going to be inspired by what they see with the Rift, and they're going to try it. And even if they say, hey, there's not enough content for me to want to buy this, or I'm not a gamer, I'm not really interested in spending a bunch of money on a gaming PC, they're at least going to try it and say, I get this. I get that VR is something I want. If there was more content, this is something I'd want. If the quality was higher, it's something I want. And I think that over the next few years, as the cost of the hardware comes down, as the quality of the hardware goes up, and most importantly, as the specs of PCs go up and people start owning PCs normally that are able to run a good VR experience, you're going to see a lot more people adopting VR. Now, earlier this week, I uh, went to HTC and I did a demo of uh, Vive's Chaperone. And for those that don't know or haven't read about it, the Vive Chaperone is basically a system that alerts you to your outside physical world if you're about to walk into a wall or you're going to hit into a chair. You can also manually trigger it. 
Um, I'm curious, is that something that you have demoed? Because I know all of you guys in VR, you talk to each other. I mean, I mean, certainly we've certainly we've looked at pretty much everything. I mean, Gear VR actually has a pass-through camera on it, so Correct, it's not yeah. necessarily a new idea. Um, honestly, if you we look at we've been talking to developers for years. We've been working with dozens of developers on making virtual reality games. Some of which we're making internally, some of which we're making externally, and very few of them are making the types of games that require enough space where you really need that type of system. The good news is it's not very hard to do something like that. It's not very hard to make a system where you can define the boundaries in software, and then when you approach those boundaries, show a grid. Actually, uh, CCP, which the you know which makes Eve Valkyrie one of our bundled right. pre-order titles, they started doing this uh, in at least E3 2014. They actually set boundaries in the cockpit seats that you were in, where if you leaned out too much, it would pull up a grid and show you how much further you could move. So. Yeah. It, it's a pretty easy thing to implement in software as far as alerting users when they're going to leave a space. There's just not many games that are actually requiring users to map out their space and do that because most of them are not relying on people having a large enough space cleared out to use VR. Is it fair to say that Oculus is working on a solution uh, similar to that for sort of safeguarding the user at home when they're in virtual reality or that we could see that soon maybe this year? Can't say anything. Can't say anything about I mean, but, but like I said, it, it, Pass through is one thing, but as far as setting up software defined boundaries, that's, I mean, it, it's basically all in software. Once you have positionally tracked controllers and a headset, it's extremely easy to define boundaries like that. So I just want to take it back to a little bit of a lighter note. Um, you know, this sort of is, I would say, a bit of a whirlwind from you know, the beginning of uh, start the buzz with VR to where we are today. So, what has that journey been like for you? I mean, especially you're 23 years old. Yes. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I've never been older than 23, so I don't know what it's like to be older and doing things like this. So I guess it kind of honestly seems normal, which is really bizarre. Um, I'm mostly doing everything the same way that I've been doing it since I started Oculus, and I'm blessed to be able to turn my hobby into a career. I still get to work on virtual reality every day. I still get to make it all happen. It's just happening on a much bigger scale than it did when I was in my garage. But like, I live in a house with six other people, uh, I, really? Oh yeah, we get along really well. Okay. Uh, we call it the commune. But I mean, like, <laughs> like I'm, I, I don't do a lot of rich person, you know, CEO executive. You don't have a Learjet. I, I bought a Tesla Model S. Okay. It's the best car in the world. Fair enough. But I mean, other, other than that, like, I love, I love hot pockets. I like, I like road trips. I like <laughs> normal things. Favorite I Favorite flavor of hot pockets. In case anyone's curious, you know, I really like the barbecue beef that comes okay. around from time to time. But okay. I'm a, I, like the original ham and cheese and pepperoni combo boxes, like you can't beat it. Okay. But I, I, I hate to say it because this is almost like when people are like, it's like when politicians say, "I'm one of you. I'm a normal <laughs> person too." But like, I, I don't know what other way to put it. Like, I am really lucky to be a pretty normal person in a place where I'm able to do something that I really like doing and I'm lucky enough that people care about what we're doing. That's, awesome. that's a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, we're about to close out, but before we do, I wanted to let you know that uh, I've been working on a story, just went live. I talked to uh, Vegas Psychics to get their predictions for the year in tech. And yeah, uh, you mentioned this earlier. I told you Professional about Professional Psychics. Professional not, not Psychics. Second rate. Yeah, they were sponsored by Oculus. And uh, I actually did ask, I said, you know, who will be the front runner in uh, the VR race? And uh, the psychic told me that it was a company that started with an O. And the logo really? was a play on the name. So, did you, yeah, did I don't you, know. Were, were there multiple psychics? There were three. I went to three. And they all said O? Only the first one. What did the other ones say? They didn't have any names. That was the only one. It starts with an O. So. I wonder, I wonder I if they know who they are. I don't know what that could are. be. I don't know. Oracle? Do you know their name? <laughs> the Madame <psychics>? Banzini? <laughs> Do I need to expedite her pre-order? <laughs> All right, Palmer. So maybe she could commune with the spirits and, and, uh, and make our launch go better. I, I, maybe. Anything's possible. This is Vegas. Well, Palmer, I want to thank you for being here and thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, this has been Engadget live from CES. Stay tuned for more from our stage.